Welcome to Nobilis Erotica, the best science fiction and fantasy erotica podcast in the known universe. This week's story... Uh... Dinosaurs? This is episode 444. I am your host, Nobilis Reed. This episode of Nobilis Erotica is sponsored by the generous patronage of Nobilis Erotica listeners. To help out paying the authors and voices that create these stories, visit patreon.com slash nobilis. The June patron-funded story is Dino Space Pirates by Stu Chabooch. Stu has been a fan of dinosaurs since he had a foam Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton in his basement at the age of four. He's since become a fan of the female form as well and is glad to merge the two interests in his writing. Stu has a sneaking suspicion that some dinosaurs were saved off-planet before the comet hit. His Jersona, that is, Jurassic persona, is an eight-foot-tall descendant of those dinosaurs, saved by a mysterious alien race. The story is read by yours truly. Here we go! Dino Space Pirates by Stu Chibooch The ship hung derelict in space. Puffs of gas escaped intermittently from the hull. Its drive engine lay ripped open, inner parts exposed. The fuel had long since evaporated. Inside the hull, two people were working. Crap, said Marianne Vega. She pushed back from the machine she'd been working on, holding out the soldering iron. There's hardly any battery power left. This will keep life support going for another few hours, maybe five if we're lucky. Peggy Terrid took the soldering iron and put it back on the work table. It clattered slowly in the low gravity. How about a distressed call, Captain Vega? No good, she replied. The hyperwave fried during our last call. If anyone had heard us, they'd be here by now. It was a war zone, after all. We're the last thing they'll be thinking about. We could send radio waves, but they won't be received for months. We'll be long dead, us and our twenty-five passengers. She looked at the soldering iron. We may as well turn off the rest of the gravity. Divert everything to life support. As Peggy packed up the toolbox, Marianne Vega placed a hand on her shoulder. Dismissed, Lieutenant. I'll be on the bridge. Do as you see fit. It's all the same. I'll be there with you, Captain, Peggy replied. Captain Vega made it to the bridge before the gravity caught out. She strapped herself into her captain's chair. Eighteen adults and their children had put their trust in her to get them out of the war zone. It should have worked, damn it, she muttered. One lousy stray shot. Peggy Terrid came into the bridge. Gravity out in two minutes, she announced, then took a seat at the navigator's station. The gravity lessened, then went to freefall. The lights dimmed. Captain Vega drifted, then began to doze. Minutes passed and rolled into hours. Her head drifted to one side in the microgravity, weightless. Her eyes blinked, then squeezed open. A red light was blinking on the console. Peggy, she started, but Peggy was already on it. Incoming signal, Captain, she said briskly. Her swiftly moving fingers activated the console. Captain Vega straightened in her chair. Full lights, on screen. Ahoy, the ship, called a voice. Dinos, Peggy said in a low whisper. Captain Skrark of the Free Wind, he announced. Reptilian skin covered a massive face. The nose protruded from a combined mouth and snout. His crest extended well above his head. The scale of the other ship was hard to discern from the view screen, but dinos were usually over eight feet tall. Captain Skrark waved a scaly hand. The claws on his fingers extended for several inches and looked very sharp. What is your status? See for yourself, Captain Vega replied. Yes, yes, we have, he replied. We actually came in for salvage, then noticed a signal of active life support. How many are you? Twenty-seven, she replied. Two crew, the rest passenger. What do you seek? she asked. We offer the usual deal, he replied. I've heard of your terms, she responded. Well then, he went on, if you agree to the deal, then find your volunteer. 
I just want to make sure that my passengers will be safe. Captain, he exclaimed, we are free traders, but we have our honor. None of our species has ever reneged on this deal. Screen off, Peggy announced. She swiveled her chair to face Captain Vega. You can't be serious. I've heard Alliance soldiers talk about their deal. Death here on the ship would be better. I might choose that for myself, said Captain Vega, and accept your choice as well. But there are twenty-five other people counting on me. She pulled her clothing to make herself as formal as possible. Screen on. Reluctantly, Peggy pressed the controls to reactivate the communication link. Captain Scrark, I accept your offer, announced Marianne Vega stiffly. A pleasure doing business with you, he replied. Who is your volunteer? Myself, replied Marianne Vega. Indeed! Emotion was hard to read on his reptilian face, but his reaction seemed to be surprised. That would be delicious. A fellow captain. Well, I accept. Prepare to be boarded. We will place you and your passengers in a hold for now. Understood, replied Captain Vega. Screen off. An hour later, the crew and passengers were assembled together on the dino ship. Although cramped, the area was fairly large by spaceship standards. Captain Scrark came in with several of his crew. They were every bit as big as they had seemed on the view screen. Their large bodies looked like a Tyrannosaurus Rex with longer arms. Their tails spread out behind them. One of the crew pushed a cart. He spoke to Captain Scrark in a language unknown to the humans. Some food, he announced. My second mate here does not speak your language well. He says we do not have food specific to your species, but the cart contains foodstuffs you can eat. There are carbohydrates and basic protein. Eat and rest. The dinos departed. They're just fattening us up, said Peggy Terrid. Several of the passengers looked at her quizzically. Well, her at least, motioning to Captain Vega. Vega gestured for her to be quiet, and Peggy shut up unhappily. Hours passed. The passengers ate and then made makeshift beds. Most slept. Marianne lay on her cushion and stared at the bulkhead ceiling. Eventually, she slept fitfully. The next morning passed uneventfully. Peggy stayed with Marianne most of the time. I would have expected them to collect by now, said Marianne at one point, after a long silence in the conversation. Don't say that, replied Peggy. But you're probably right. They're taking longer than we expected to salvage the ship, wrecking it as they go. Well, I'm not going to miss it for long, said Marianne. She got up and checked on the passengers, giving encouragement as she went. Finally, a dino appeared at the door. His accent was thick but understandable. Captain Vega, Captain Skrark would like to see you now. Marianne stood. Don't go, said Peggy. And then what? asked Marianne. We'll fight. A dino? asked Marianne. A single one could kill all of us in minutes. The claws alone would do it, and that's before their strength comes in. No, I made a deal, and I'll stick with it. She looked Peggy hard in the eyes. Make sure the passengers get to safety. Then she turned swiftly and exited with the dino. They went down a hallway, then took an antigrav lift to the next level. A moment later, the dino stopped in front of a door. Here, he said in a thick accent. He pressed a button and the door slid back. She walked in. Captain Scrark sat on a huge chair. There was a wide gap between seat and back where his tail passed through. He was no longer in his uniform, but rather in an informal tunic. He stood as she entered the room. There was a wide, low platform in a cabinet. Something that seemed to be a sink took up one corner of the room. So, you are here, he said. Yes, she replied stiffly. She walked to the middle of the room and stood stock still. You do not choose to select someone else? He flexed his hand casually. The claws glinted, reflecting the light from the room's sole lamp. No, she replied. This is my choice. Very well, responded Captain Scrark. Let us begin. Would you like to sit, have a drink? 
Is that required? she asked. No, but you may find it easier if you relax. Let's get on with it, she barked. Would you like to disrobe first? he asked. Just do what you're going to do, she said in a low, guttural voice. As you wish. Captain Scrark stood up. His tremendous bulk was even more impressive in person. He stood over eight feet tall. He strode over, the power of his legs expressed in the easy way he moved his body. His arms rippled with muscle. He lifted one hand up and flexed the fingers. His claws extended several inches from each fingertip. As he stood, he removed his tunic, leaving only a pair of shorts. Marianne Vega closed her eyes. She felt a slight wind as his hand rose past her face. The hand descended. She felt the claws right next to her skin, but there was no pain. She opened her eyes. Scrark had sliced open her clothes from head to toe. Only her panties remained on. Scrark picked her up and placed her on the platform. He then went to the cabinet. Marianne flinched as he opened the cabinet door, then looked up, puzzled, as he returned with a pair of gloves. They left the palm and fingers open while covering the claws in blunt rubber. I thought, aren't you going to eat me? she asked. Oh, yes, he replied. But the claws, the glove, you're going to kill me, right? That's the deal. One sacrifice. We heard how dinos crave human flesh. One victim goes in, they almost never return. The few that come back never speak of it. We certainly do crave human flesh, he responded, and I am going to eat you, but you will not die. I think you may be misinformed as to the nature of the deal. But the Alliance soldiers, they said... Scrark looked at Marianne, fixing her with an unblinking reptilian stare. The Alliance blockades your planets so that they are the only source of scarce goods for which they can charge any price they like. And yet, you trust their word? Scrark came back to the bed. He sat down next to Marianne, his tail splayed out off to one side. He leaned in, his torso crossing hers, his weight supported by his arms. He opened his mouth slightly and extended his tongue. Scrark shifted his body, bringing his head down to Marianne's chest. His long lizard tongue reached out and caressed her right breast. The tongue tapered toward the end, going from rough in the back to a fine feel in the front, surprisingly soft for such a large being. Scrark's tongue enveloped the bottom of the breast, circling around it. He lifted the entirety of the breast with his large tongue, caressing the underside. Then, with the soft tongue tip, he played with her nipple. Slow strokes at first, then swift. He brought up his hand and cupped the breast from the side. He squeezed the breast while continuing to stimulate the nipple. Marianne gasped. She had expected something far different. As her body started to respond, she felt a sensation in her nether regions. Scrark seemed to know exactly how to excite her. She reached up and caressed his chest, feeling the hard muscles under his rough skin. She raked her fingernails across him, hardly leaving a mark. Just as she was beginning to become overstimulated on the right breast, Scrark removed his tongue from it. He licked around the nape of her neck, gently flicking from the shoulder up. Marianne reached up to his torso, placing one arm as far around as she could reach. She reared up and kissed his chest, nipping the skin in places. The other one! Do the other one! she moaned. Scrark reached one powerful arm around her body and lifted her up. He shifted his bulk so that he sat facing her, his tail behind him and off the bed. For as Marianne had realized, the platform was intended for a far different purpose than she had assumed. He pushed back, then leaned in. His head faced Marianne's chest. Keeping her encircled in his muscular arm, he nuzzled her left breast with his cheek. The razor-sharp teeth came dangerously close to her vulnerable skin, but Scrark was in complete control. His tongue flicked out tentatively at first, then encircling the nipple with the tip of his tongue. Scrark continued to hold Marianne close with one arm while he reached out to touch her left breast with his other hand. He stroked the outside of the breast with the underside of his fingers, touching her with the portion of his hand left outside the glove. He grasped the nipple lightly between his thumb and forefinger, gently at first. Then he squeezed, firmly, but with only a fraction of the strength behind his powerful hands. 
Marianne gasped as the sensation traveled from her nipples down to the moistening region between her legs. Marianne caressed his torso with both hands, feeling the change of skin texture from upper body to abdomen. His stomach muscles seemed as hard as the rest of him. He scrunched closer, letting her hands explore. The tip of Skrark's penis showed above the top of his shorts. Marianne reached in, feeling its hard girth. He was at least twelve inches long and as wide as her wrist. She stroked him with both hands, rubbing from head to shaft. <laughs> Skrark made inchoate noises in his throat. Oh, you like that, huh? said Marianne. How about this? She pulled down his shorts and stroked the head of the shaft several times, then put her lips on the tip. Ah! came the incoherent answer of Skrark. He leaned back. With his hands, he took the shorts the rest of the way off. Marianne moved her lips up and down the shaft. She was barely able to fit the entire head in her mouth, but managed to stretch wide for it. She licked the top while stroking up and down the shaft with her hands. Skrark made guttural noises as she worked it. She cupped the testicles while stroking, and Skrark growled louder. After several minutes, Marianne tasted several drops of pre-cum. Skrark said, Not yet, and gently pushed her away. My turn, he said. He laid her down on the bed as she held on to his torso. She looked into his eyes as they lay down and saw a fierce lust in them. He caressed her breasts again, but this time for only a short moment. His tongue licked her belly button repeatedly. He seemed fascinated. We don't have these. We are egg-born, he said. That sounds fascinating, said Marianne, her voice thick with lust. Skrark started working lower. His tongue reached the edge of her panties. She lifted her pelvis off the bed and Skrark took the panties off gently, exposing her thatch of nether hair. He grasped her butt cheeks and with both hands pulled her toward him. Working his way down from the panty line, Skrark licked down the pubic mound, then tongued the very tip of her clitoris. Marianne made a small gasp as he vibrated his tongue over her clitoral hood. She spread her legs wider to let him come in closer. Skrark moved his head in while also continuing to hold one butt cheek in his hand. He squeezed firmly as he licked the labia. The sensitive small part of his tongue played up and down on her clitoris, while the larger part moved side to side on her labia. Marianne felt her orgasm coming half minute off. She squeezed Skrark on his arm, and he seemed to understand the signal. He kept up continual stimulation as she began to shudder, moaning as the orgasm hit. But he wasn't done. He slowed down for a few minutes after her first orgasm, giving her time to recuperate. Then he plunged back in, licking faster and applying more pressure on her labia. He used the underside of his fingers to stimulate her clitoris, rubbing in a circular motion while licking her labia up and down. Her second orgasm was longer and crested higher. Marianne grabbed both his arms as she came, crying out in full-throated moan as her orgasm hit in several waves. When it was over, she pulled back, taking a moment to recover, breathing heavily. A minute or two later, she had recovered her breath. All right, big boy, and I do mean big. Let's see about that. She grasped his penis in one hand, noticing with pleasure that it was still rock hard. Yes, now, Squark assented. He looked at her as if suddenly remembering something. We have relaxants that may help you to accommodate. If we have to, let's try without first. She put her mouth on his cock again, lubricating it up and down with saliva. Squark pulled her to the edge of the bed. He stood off of it, and Marianne noticed for the first time the bed was just at the height of his genitals. He took her legs in his arms, lifting up. With one hand she grasped the shaft of his penis. She guided it into her vagina. Slowly, she said. Marianne took several deep breaths and relaxed her muscles as much as she could. With a gentleness that belied his size, Skrark carefully eased in the tip of his shaft. <laughs> He growled, low in his throat. Marianne gasped. The size of his member was almost too much. Almost. Marianne pushed up, supporting her weight with one arm. With the other, she placed her palm on Skrark's abdomen, controlling the depth of his entry. He thrust, making low, short strokes. 
She moaned as he entered further. Marianne looked into his eyes. They were wild, mad with lust. She pushed harder with her palm, keeping him from going too fast. As her vagina expanded to accommodate him, she let him in deeper and deeper. All, put it all in, she gasped, as he was finally able to penetrate to the bottom of his shaft. Marianne leaned down, laying full on the bed. Squark lay down as well, bringing his full bulk into contact with her body. He supported his weight on his two powerful arms, rubbing his torso on her. He placed only enough weight on her to stimulate her. Marianne tried to put her arms around him, but his size was too much. She rubbed her hands up and down the sides of his body as he continued to thrust into her. He varied his depth, pulling all the way out and doing small strokes at the top, using only the tip and first few inches of his member, before pushing all the way in. Squark cupped his arms around her, holding her right next to him. She tingled and felt a small orgasm shudder through her, then another. A wave of them hit one just after the other. Marianne felt Squark thrusting faster and heard low, guttural moans from his throat, but she wasn't ready for this lovemaking to be over yet. With a hand, she stopped his motion. His eyes, cloudy, cleared somewhat. Up! Lift me up! Skark held Marianne close and lifted her, their bodies touching. He remained inside her, his member keeping them connected. She patted the bed. Down! Skark sat on the bed, his tail splayed behind him. Marianne remained on him. Hold tight, she instructed. She held on to his powerful neck as he supported her with his arms. She moved her pelvis slowly, grinding against him. Pleasure pinged through her body. She swiveled around the base of his shaft, rubbing her labia against his member first one side, then the other. Squark held her firmly, giving her free rein to control the action. Marianne built her own orgasm, keeping Squark close as well. She rocked back and forth on his vast member. Her excitement built further and further. Her orgasm swelled through her. Marianne's arms loosened as she came, and she cried out in pleasure. Squark held her firmly and swiftly placed her back onto the bed, laying on top of her. He supported his weight as before. His own urgency built to a crescendo. His hands gripped the side of the bed and crumpled handprints into it. His finesse completely gone, he thrust his way to orgasm in a few swift strokes. He climaxed in a shuddering fit, his body rippling with excitement. <laughs> he said, incoherent as he came. He stayed within her for several moments. Marianne reached up and kissed his chest. She ran her hands up and down his muscular torso a few more times. When both were ready, he pulled out. His member was still semi-rigid. Moments later, he lay beside her on the bed. Soon, you must decide. You may stay as one of us, or return to your people. But if you return, you cannot come back to us. Why? asked Marianne. It is our tradition, replied Squark. You would certainly be welcome here. I think that tradition is due to change, said Marianne. Exhausted, she drifted off to sleep. In her semi-conscious state, she murmured, I have got to let Peggy know about this. And that's our story. In addition to my abiding gratitude, Patreon supporters are currently receiving episodes of an unexpurgated, unauthorized version of a planetary romance from the beginning of the 20th century. To find out what I'm talking about, join us at patreon.com slash nobilis. This week, I've got a big thank you for the patron who signed up at the $100 level for a custom written story. I'm working on that and should have it ready to present in August. You have been listening to the Nobilis Erotica podcast. Theme music is composed and performed by Mass Relay. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Until next time, listen hard. <laughs>